Today is the 5th of October, 2021. We've come together to practice the Dhamma, train our minds. And so we start with generosity and virtue, which we know about well already. And for those with faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, they likely uh, you know well about this quality of generosity of dana, and have this quality of generosity uh, well established. Wherever the monastic sangha goes, the uh, faith of, or the laity with faith offer the four requisites of cloth, uh, food, shelter, and medicine. And the faithful lady also help build the buildings in the monasteries, like the meditation halls, the monastic dwellings. So they help in these uh, various ways. And also those with faith in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha help society, uh, those parts of society that are experiencing stress or suffering, for example, from floods, from fires, from earthquakes, from pandemics, seeing that society is having a difficult time, then these individuals help according to their ability, according to their strength. And some individuals don't uh, give to the monasteries, but they help those that are impoverished or those experiencing difficulties or help others uh, with their schooling and their studies. And this is good, all the same whatever the type of giving and sacrifice it is, this is all uh, good, it's all types of goodness. Because the, the point or the meaning is for the mind to have goodness. <clears throat> for the mind to have goodness. So when one is ready, one can do both, such as Anattapindaka, the foremost male lay supporter in the time of the Buddha. He had very high level of generosity parami, the spiritual perfection of generosity. He offered the monastery land, and on one occasion he actually covered the land that he wanted to offer with gold coins. So this is due to his faith uh, that he wanted to offer this land to the Buddha, and this became the Jetavana Monastery. And Anattapindaka also helped society in various ways. So he did both supporting the monastic Sangha and helping those in need, helping society. So he did goodness in all various ways. And he was a Arya Pugala, a noble being, having realized a stage of enlightenment, that of stream entry. So his faith was stable in the Buddhist dispensation. And Lady Visaka, the foremost female lay supporter at the time of the Buddha, the foremost female lay supporter of the Buddha Sasana is the same. He has a lot of goodness, a lot of merit and parami. And like Anattapindaka, they were both uh, stream enters, Sotapanas. And their spiritual virtues were uh, vast and great. And in the case of Anattapindaka, his daughter had an even higher level of wisdom uh, than him. And actually all of his children realized uh, noble stages of enlightenment, realized uh, noble discipleship, and they were intelligent as well. There's the case of one of Anattapindaka Anattapindaka's sons, who didn't want to follow in his father's footsteps because he saw that he had a lot of wealth, his family had a lot of wealth, and so he just wanted to go on adventures, go traveling, and have fun with all this material wealth. And having been born into this world, it's normal to think this way. No one's born thinking that they want to overcome suffering. But it's up to one's merit and spiritual virtues that this 
desire or overcoming of suffering just happens on its own. So this son of Natapindika had built a lot of spiritual virtues already, but his father was very intelligent as well. He knew that his son needed money in order to travel and have fun. And so he told his son that well, you can go on a trip and go traveling, but you have to listen to the Dhamma as well. And he told his son he just had to memorize one or two sentences of what the Buddha taught. And so the son agreed to this and went to go listen to the Dhamma, went to the monastery, and he went to sit and listen to the Dhamma talk that the Buddha was giving. And he sat in the furthest spot away from the Buddha. He sat in the very back row because he was afraid of the Dhamma, afraid of overcoming suffering. Because the Kilesas didn't want him to have the faith to ordain or have the faith and wisdom to overcome suffering. The Kilesas didn't accept this. The defilements didn't accept this. So the defilements had him sit far away, had him sit the furthest in the furthest spot. But we have to remember that this is the fully self-awakened Buddha teaching. And so no matter what distance one was uh, sitting at, then one could hear the Buddha's voice uh, clearly and hear it well. So it's just like in the present day we have technology like uh, smartphones. So no matter how far away we are, we can still hear. Like currently using the uh, Zoom video conferencing and having audio and video and using the internet. And so one can hear clearly even across an entire continent or across the world. So one shouldn't feel like it's strange that one could hear the Buddha when one sat even far away from the Buddha, because the Buddha had the most parami in the whole world. So one sitting far away could still hear him clearly. And so the Buddha gave teachings on generosity, virtue, and meditation. And in the end, the mind of Anattapindika's son gathered together and realized stream entry. He saw clearly that it's just like this. So when he came back to his father, he didn't want the money that his father uh, said he would give him. He wasn't interested in this material wealth anymore because he had found something higher and better, which is the Dhamma. So this is an example. So we see that whatever material wealth and money there is in the world, whatever value it has, the Dhamma has a higher value because the Dhamma is limitless, is boundless, is without compare, is apamano dhammo, apamano buddho, apamano sangho. Limitless are the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And Anattapindika had many various duties, had a lot of uh, jobs and duties in his life. For instance, uh, nowadays we can look at, for instance, a village, a head person, they help out and have generosity in their village. And in Atapindika, he was looked up to and respected by all these various levels of society. And he's very active in society. And so all the individuals in society respected him. And Anattapindika was known particularly for helping uh, the poor and those in difficulty. Because this word anatta means one who is uh, poor or impoverished in difficulty. And so his name, Anattapindika, it means one who is the refuge of the poor. And he got this name because he helped the poor and impoverished all the time. He helped them continuously. And he was so intent on doing generosity that he gave away all his wealth until there was almost nothing left. And one of the devas, one of the heavenly beings at his residence felt uh, hot in its heart, seeing that Anattapindika had very little left to give. 
Manata Pindika just had some uh, rice porridge uh, left that was all he had to give, and yet he was still intent to give this uh, rice porridge. So he didn't stop his generosity even then. But Anatta Pindika had such a high level of parami, spiritual virtues, that there was a field under his ownership, and during the uh, plowing of that field, some gold was found, and gold rose up in that field. And so this gold coming up from under the earth uh, was sufficient to replace his wealth. He regained his wealth. And even in the present day, people find gold under the ground in India. So this is something that happens. So for those with merit, then this can arise. So when one is ready, one has generosity and one practices sila as well, practices virtue, practicing not to harm others through actions of body or speech, not to kill, not to engage in wrong livelihood, but to engage in a livelihood that doesn't harm other beings. So may you practice like this. And nowadays in the world, there's a lot of online communication and uh, social media like Facebook and so on. And so we should be careful what we write and what we believe in when we read it. Because if we just believe too easily, then this isn't correct. So we need to restrain our minds, to restrain them to be within the realm of merit and goodness, and to be uh, content with little, to be restrained and content. We have a if we have a husband or a wife, then we're content with that individual. We feel like that's enough and we restrain our behavior. We don't let the defilements uh, carry us away. And when we gather together with others, we practice to have truthfulness, to speak in ways that are honest, to avoid speech that's uh, coarse and harsh, to avoid divisive speech or malicious speech or false speech, or idle speech. And we need mindfulness and wisdom to be well established. And so therefore we refrain from consuming intoxicants or drugs which uh, muddle our mindfulness and wisdom, not to consume alcohol and other uh, substances like that. And so we practice to establish ourselves well in generosity, virtue, and meditation. And we practice according to our strength and energy. And in terms of bhavana, in terms of mental cultivation, we build up this quality of mindfulness. Because these qualities of mindfulness and clear awareness are qualities that we need to have all the time, well established in ourselves. When we go out traveling, we see that people bring a lot of uh, smart phones and tablets and so on. So we need to bring our mindfulness as well. And then uh, bring wisdom too, to have mindfulness and wisdom, and to have this uh, generosity, virtue, and meditation. So we see that this is very important in our Dhamma practice. Because within a given day, the mind receives a lot of different sense impressions and proliferates based on these impressions. And we remember the sense impressions from the past and proliferate based on these as well. Uh, therefore, what should we do? Or we should practice, try to cultivate wisdom to know sense impressions in time as they arise, as they enter the mind. Because when sense impressions enter the mind, they deceive the mind. When sense impressions enter the mind, they deceive the mind. Because in truth, sense impressions are just sense impressions. There's really nothing there. So we practice to have knowing, to know that it's just a sense impression, that really there's no one there that's deceiving the mind. If, or no one's there, no one can deceive the mind when the mind has the knower well established. But without the knower, then these sense impressions enter 
and the mind has ignorance. And so the sense impressions enter, the mind proliferates, and the mind is lost and deluded. It starts to cling and attach and get lost in liking or disliking. So it's like this. But the mind that has wisdom and mindfulness is a mind that's lokutara, above the world. It's not liking or disliking, but it's uh, gone beyond, gone beyond the world. So we train our minds to be lokutara, above the world, to cultivate the path of giving virtue and meditation, to bring our minds to peace and collectedness to cultivate a lot of mindfulness. Because we see that this quality of mindfulness is like the immune system for our minds. And we use this immune system of mindfulness to fight with the world. For instance, we get a vaccine to protect against a virus. And so that when the virus, if we meet with the virus, then we have a protection against it already. And so we do the same with our minds. We practice to build up the immune system in our minds, which is mindfulness and wisdom. So if we don't have this immune system in our mind, then we don't have peace, we don't have collectedness, we don't have stability. Then when sense impressions enter, the mind lacks strength. So therefore we need to build up the immune system in the mind, first of all. Because in the world there are many types of medicine. For instance, uh, with the COVID vaccines, there's the Pfizer brand, the Moderna brand, the AstraZeneca, the Sinovac, the Sinopharm, and so on. And so there are many different medicines to protect against disease. But none of these medicines are able to protect our hearts against uh, sense impressions, against defilements. So we see that these, this Dhamma, these Dhamma teachings are medicine uh, for the mind, just like the vaccines are medicine for the body. So therefore we build up the immune system in the mind. It's just like making a house or a home for the mind. We have a house for the body to protect the body from various uh, weather and elements and so on. And so we train our minds to build up this house for our hearts, which is the heart that has collectedness, that has samadhi. So this is something that we need to practice. If we don't practice, then we just have a little bit of uh, collectedness, a little bit of peace here and there. So we need to practice, we need to fight, we need to cultivate, to build up these good qualities, to give strength and energy to our minds to make it so that our minds are able to cross over sense impressions and become lokutara above the world. When the mind in this state sees material things, sees the physical body as empty. So may you contemplate this a lot. Sometimes mindfulness is weak and the mind clings to sense impressions. So this is normal. So in these when this happens, just teach the mind that it's uncertain, it's unsure, it's impermanent. Try to have knowing with the mind. And whether one is lazy or diligent, then keep doing it, keep practicing. Whether it's hot or cold, keep practicing. Whether it's raining or sunny, keep practicing. Practice all the time. So may you have effort in this practice. And then in the end, then you must meet with success. In the beginning, it's difficult. It feels like something that's very difficult and hard to do. It's like in the beginning with study or work, we feel that it's difficult, but we must uh, do it. So just like this practice, it can feel very troublesome and difficult in the beginning, but one perseveres to bring the mind to peace, to stillness, to cultivate mindfulness and collectedness, to contemplate regularly as part of our practice, to bring the mind to be above the world. So in the beginning we have faith, but it's not faith to the level of wanting to overcome suffering. 
Perhaps it's sufficient faith to have generosity well established, to have uh, constant generosity, and maybe a, just a little bit of faith in the practice of virtue. But to find one who is intent to meditate and cultivate the mind, this is the hardest to find and the hardest thing to do because the defilements are constantly trying to pull the mind away from the practice to get lost in liking for uh, physical forms, uh, sights, smells, tastes, uh, sounds, touches, and mental objects. And then when one doesn't have uh, sufficient faith to be intent in the practice, then one ends up with only a little bit of time uh, to bring the mind to peace. But when one uh, does bring the mind to peace, then one can use this energy of collectedness in one's work and duties. This is something that's possible. Or one can use this energy to contemplate the body as empty. So this quality of samadhi can be used in many different ways. So may you be diligent and firm in this practice. May you be intent to know and see the Dhamma, to bring the mind above and beyond the world, to see all materiality and mentality is empty. So may you all grow in Dhamma.